Uh, first up is going to be Mark Harrison. He's a senior sysadmin at Chef. Uh, he is the sysadmin in a company full of sysadmins. And uh, he's going to talk about migrating hosted Chef to AWS. Thank you. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. OK, uh, quick show of hands. How many people here use hosted Chef? OK, fair amount of you. OK, keep, keep your hand up. And keep it up if you knew we migrated last year, before this talk. If you knew we migrated Hosted Chef to AWS last year. OK. So <laughs> hmm? I'm just curious how many people actually knew. Um, OK, for those who don't know, um, Hosted Chef is Chef Software as a Service product for Chef Server. And it's pretty big. It's got about 100,000 organizations. It's got about 400,000 nodes. And unlike most web services or websites, um, it's got a very, very spiky load profile. And what I mean by this is, um, here's a normal website. So normal websites, over the course of a day, you've got like the lull in the morning, and then your customers wake up. It starts to grow slowly, and then you hit the peak of the day, which some people, it's like midday. For Netflix, it's probably 8 PM. And then people go to bed, and it starts to go back down again. Um, this is the hosted chef request per second graph. And this is over 12 hours. Now, I don't know if you can see there, but there's spikes at the top of every hour and then smaller spikes uh, at 30 minutes past the hour. Anyone care to guess why that might be? Anyone not from Chef? <laughs> Go ahead. Precisely. People are running Chef, Chef Client via Chrome. If you run Chef, via, as a, if you run Chef Client as a daemon, then <clears throat> it will actually pick a random time but if you run it via cron, it can start immediately. And um, sometimes there's a little bit of display, and you can configure that. But if you don't configure that, um, then it just runs immediately at the top of the hour. What that means is that we have to cope with this huge increase in load at the top of every hour, and at the bottom, and at 15 minutes and 45. <laughs> so yesterday, um, you all went to the keynote, and you may have noticed um, Seth mention hosted in 2010. And he mentioned this command, naive EC2 server create. And yet I'm talking here about moving Chef to AWS and not from AWS. So I just want to explain a little bit there. In 2010, hosted Chef actually used to be in AWS. And then around about 2011, we actually moved to um, Rackspace, bare metal, um, because of performance issues. So it's actually somewhat ironic that the performance issues are what led us to migrate back to AWS last year. So why did we actually move? Well, we were outgrowing our, our current infrastructure. We were hitting some scaling issues. But the reasons for moving to AWS are the reasons that all of you want to move to the cloud. Cost, um, flexibility, basically the ability to get what you want, when you want it, for as long as you want it, and only pay for what you need. Um, and the ability to scale up as needed. So no lead time, we don't have to wait two, um, two weeks for a new service to arrive. <clears throat> well, there's one other reason. Developer time. <clears throat> so the developers were spending lots and lots of time supporting Hosted. And the reason for this is Hosted looked nothing like an on-prem chef install that you use. So, oh, and also, um, we were using the same configuration, like chef cookbook, chef recipes, that we've been using for hosted since the time it was in AWS previously. So we still had like configuration from like chef 0 0.9 and old ways of doing things, and it was time for us to modernize things. So here is a normal on-prem chef install. This is what any of you will install if you want to scale your um, chef infrastructure or chef server. You've got load balancer at the beginning. Then you've got some front ends, one or more, more if you need to scale up. And then you've got a couple of back ends in a HA pair. 
This is the architecture diagram for old hosted. Now, you might not be able to see it very well there, but we've got, let's see, two different load balancers, Nginx. We've got three Erlang services. Um, every different microservice that um, hosted Chef runs, or the Chef server runs, um, that had its own machine or its own set of machines. So that's another big reason that we want to move. Um, so the devs were basically spending way too much time supporting that big architecture. They were doing deployments, helping with troubleshooting. And we wanted to be able to make Hosted Chef look a lot more like the Chef service that all of you install. And if we could do that, then we would get lots and lots of benefits. And we, uh, we ops could run the Hosted Chef infrastructure without having to rely on devs providing custom code for us, because they're providing the code for everybody else. And this is how we did. This is the architecture diagram for new hosted. And it's got a few services split out, but overall, it's pretty close. It's a lot better than that. So we've decided we wanted to move. We decided we're going to AWS, and we decided roughly how we want it to look. Now we have to actually do the migration. So we split the migration up into about three different tasks or projects. Um, getting things running in AWS, actually migrating the data, and then monitoring everything once we've done. Now, Monitor Alma was two weeks ago, so I'm going to focus on the first two. Um, so the first task was to set things up in AWS. So you run dpackage uh, D install, chef server core, chef server CTL reconfigure, chef server CTL start, and you're done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> it's not actually that easy. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. Um, so one of the first things that we had to do was split out some of the back-end services. So I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> um, you had these just two back-end services in HA pair. The problem with that is you have um, your stateful services, so you've got RDS that, um, that, hold, that stores all of your chef data, and you've also got search. The problem with that is to scale up, you basically need to buy a bigger instance. Um, so has anyone seen those like, new X1 giant Godzilla instances? We didn't want to have to get one of them, because the cost is like about 1000 an hour, something ridiculous like that. So we split out our data and search into separate services. So for the Chef database, we decided to use RDS. And thankfully, it's got the, Amazon's got this magic service. You push a button, and you get this database hand-delivered by magical Amazon elves. So database, solve, database problem solved, right? Actually. RDS has worked out really, really well for us so far. For the Chef database, at least, um, RDS has been working fairly swimmingly. For the reporting database, which I'll get to later, that's another story. Next component in the back ends, search. And that has three main components. Um, the Solar service, RabbitMQ, which um, Solar actually holds all your search information when you run knife search. RabbitMQ takes all the information when you make a change um, in Chef, like you save your node, it posts it onto the queue. And then there's a service called Chef Expander, which takes the changes off the queue and then posts the changes to Solar. And if you're actually using a brand new version of Chef Server, using the, like, the new Chef HA that's been released in the past two weeks, all of this is actually just Elasticsearch. Um, <clears throat> What we decided to do was just keep all these services together on the backend machine. And there's one other component of that diagram that's part of the backend that I've not mentioned yet, and that is Redis. Um, Redis, it's used by the front end machines basically for things like feature flags, web sessions, and a way for us to enable maintenance mode across all of the servers. You've got Nginx, um, the load balancer at the front, um, re 
listening to Redis or checking Redis for information for things like how to set maintenance mode. For that, we just used Elastic Cache. It's um, basically hosted Redis as a service, and we just have to use that. That brings us to the front ends. So on old hosted, and this is part of the reason for that big diagram before, you had all of these services, Earthchef, Bifrost, OCID, on its own server. Um, most of these services are pretty stateless, so we were able to combine these, and in a normal Chef server install that's on-prem, all of these are combined onto the same machine. All the stateless services just on front ends, and you can horizontally scale them. So there's just a few other parts of the infrastructure left. First off, cookbook storage. When you upload your cookbooks, the actual physical data um, where you have your recipes and attributes and all the actual cookbook data, that gets uploaded to S3. That made the migration process really easy because in old hosted, it was in S3. In new hosted, it was in S3. We didn't have to do anything. Um, other components, load balancer in front of everything. We just use Amazon's ELB. Um, that was a fairly easy decision. That just goes in front of the front end, load balances everything. And then there's one other machine we have in hosted that you may or may not have um, in an on-prem install. That is a support box. And basically that is a machine we can log into. It's configured as a front end, but it's not in the load balancer. And we use that for troubleshooting, password resets, um, any issues you might come across with orgs that we might need some manual fixes. We just use that as support, um, do all that on the support box. So we've got the various components decided. Now we have to actually get things running. So the first thing we do is we put everything into auto-scaling groups. Now, when you hear auto-scaling groups, you think about machines magically growing, like you see the load growing and it spins up new machines. Problem is, our spiky load, that was for, it went jumped up at the top of every hour and then went right back down again and it takes about 10 minutes to spin up a new node. So we don't actually use auto-scaling groups to auto-scale our infrastructure. We need to be at full capacity anyway. What we use auto-scaling groups for is we set a static threshold and AWS makes sure that there's always 16 nodes or 14 nodes, whatever we set it to. And that means it just reinforces the idea that we want to treat our servers as cattle and not pets. We, if we have a machine that's misbehaving, we can just kill it, and AWS will just bring up a new machine to replace it, and that is really, really nice when you get paged. So, if we're using auto-scaling groups, if you're using auto-scaling auto groups, you need to build images, AMIs. And to do that, we use Packer. We build images every time we deploy a change, which isn't that often. Um, like new chef server versions, something like that, or config changes. And when we do that, we destroy all of our old um, front ends or our old um, instances, and we recreate new ones. So most of the setup that we do is actually done in Packer during the image build. There's about three, three types of things that we do afterwards. That is anything that's specific to the environment, so anything that needs to be different between, say, acceptance and delivered, um, or pre-prod and prod. Um, anything that's specific to the instance itself, things like host names or node names, um, specific chef configuration, and credentials, which they're actually kind of a specific case of um, environment-specific config, but we treat them separately because um, they kind of need some special treatment there. All additional configuration after boot, it's done with Chef. So that configuration, um, when, we when the machine starts up, we have a user data script that sets up Chef and runs it on boot. So with AWS, you can set um, a shell script that it just runs on, on boot when the instance comes up. Um, now, we can't actually use the validatorless bootstrap method. That's the one where you don't need a validator key. Um, 
because we need the machines to register themselves as part of the auto scaling group. So we just drop a validation key in Etsy Chef, um, tell Chef to run, the machine registers itself, and it goes on to configure things. Um, we also use policy files to manage configuration, and that's been really useful for a number of reasons, and you can read about the benefits of policy files. Um, one big thing that we do is we make use of something called named run lists. And this is a separate run list for a node that you can run um, by specifying it by name. So what we do there in Packer, we say use the build run list, and it just does the build time config. And then we've got our normal run list, which does all of the configuration with Chef, including the environment specific, the credentials, and the other things I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> So for the actual AWS resources, instances, RDS, um, Elastic Cache, we use Terraform. That manages all of our AWS resources, and it makes provisioning really easy. Um, you just, it's your infrastructure, or rather the instances and the actual AWS resources as code. And one of the ways that this is really, really helpful about four days before we migrated, or rather four days before we were scheduled to migrate, we were happily set up in US West 2. One big problem with that, most of our customers were located in US East 1. So we'd, we were in US West 2 because of reasons, but um, someone made the decision to actually move us to US East 1 to be close to where all the customers are. And we were able to manage that migration in roughly one day. And that migration, that day, was mostly transferring data that we'd already got in place and going through the Terraform config and the Chef config, just removing any assumptions we had about, re about regions. So I mentioned earlier, when we do auto-scaling groups, we build an AMI and then we destroy our instances and recreate them. Problem is, if you do that, you destroy all your instances, hosted chef goes down. So what we actually do is we rebuild our images in Packer, we bring up the new instances in a separate auto-scaling group that is not live. And we run a few tests, and then once we get everything working, we verify it's all there, we swap out the auto-scaling groups. And what that lets us do, it lets us test beforehand, and it um, also lets us quickly roll back if things go wrong. So we only do this for the front ends. And one of the reasons for that is auto-scaling groups and blue-green deploys, they work really, really well for stateless machines. You can just kill an instance and it'll come back and no one really cares. For stateful services, such as our backend, that's running your search, that has a lot of data, and we need to be much more careful with that. Uh, we can't just kill an instance, because that might be the instance where all the data stood. So we just need to make sure that when we do, um, when we do our deploys and we need to change things, we make sure we kill the secondary backend first, and then we fail over, and then we can do the old primary. Um, if you have single machines, you can still use auto-scaling groups. Now, if you've got a single machine, chances are you don't really care about, um, about it going down, because you're in AWS. In AWS, instances randomly get destroyed. And if you think that doesn't happen, you've got another thing coming. It does. But our support box that I mentioned before, that's just a machine we SSH into to do some troubleshooting or to reset passwords. If that goes down for five minutes, we don't care. But if it goes down for five minutes, we still want AWS to bring, it, bring up a replacement for us. And that's happened numerous times. The support box has just disappeared. And I've logged in and I'm like, oh, this is a new box. And I'd never even known because we don't need to monitor it. We don't need to know because we don't really care that the support box is there until we actually decide we want to log in. So you can still use auto-scaling groups for single machines. So we're now up to the migration process itself. We know how we want to um, get everything up and running in AWS. Now we need to migrate. 
So like the project as a whole, we split up the migration into a few different tasks. Moving the database, specifically the chef server database and the reporting database. Moving the search data, um, all the backend data, solar content, and finally, um, actually flipping the switch, flipping DNS, and moving people over to the new, um, new infrastructure. First thing on that list is migrating the Chef server. So the Chef, sorry, the Chef database server. The Chef database server is where all of your data stores, where like it's got nodes, it's got um, roles, it's got um, your clients on the cookbook metadata, basically everything except for the cookbooks themselves. And in old hosted, this was actually three databases. We had one for the chef server itself, and then we had two others for a service called Bifrost, which did authentication, and a service for OCID, which also did authentication for a different service. In new hosted, we decided we just want to merge all those databases into one, which is what an on-premise store looks like. So, we chose RDS earlier to host the database. So one big problem with that, you can't do streaming replication from Postgres into RDS. I think you might be able to now, because um, AWS has got this like database migration service, um, but at the time, we couldn't, um, we couldn't do that. We had to just copy the data, all the data wholesale from our old database into RDS. Um, thankfully, the database is rather small. All the data for everyone in Hosted Chef is actually less than 100 gig. So we were able to just copy everything across and do, uh, copy everything across during the migration. Next on that list was the reporting database. Now, reporting is the chef server add-on, chef server reporting add-on. And that keeps records of every chef run you, you do against hosted, which is a lot of data. At the time of the migration, that was about two to three terabytes, which I know some, data, some databases can be bigger, but that was something that we certainly couldn't just copy across in five minutes. And RDS only supports up to about six terabytes. So allowing for some growth, we couldn't be in RDS. So for our reporting database, we decided to use just normal EC2 instances running Postgres, which it meant we had to manage those databases, but it also meant we could use streaming replication. And that meant during the migration, for our, um, reporting at least, we could just um, replicate all the data, and then when the migration came, we just fail over the database, and migration is, for that is pretty much instant. <coughs> but before we could do the replication, you need to take a base backup. Now, old hosted data center, bare metal, image cargo, we had gigabit connection. So you do your math, and comes out at about one terabyte every three hours at gigabit speeds. Now, you never really get your full bandwidth for various reasons. So we're doing two to three terabytes. Let's allow a full day. Should be plenty of time. Three days later, We made a few mistakes with our calculations. First thing, we're transferring across the US. So you got to deal with latency. That will slow down your transfer rates. Latency wasn't the biggest issue we had though, because we were going from Chicago, so it's probably not all the way across the US, middle of the country, to the East Coast. Um, but we also assumed that we had full gigabit. Normal hosted traffic, because, well, hosted, we still had to serve everybody. Um, that ate about half of our bandwidth allocation, so we're already down to half. On top of that, reporting, that stores every chef run. 
and people are querying every chef run they've ever done, or at least querying every chef run, say, for the past month. That's a lot of data, and the reporting server disks were constantly saturated. So that meant there was basically nothing left for us to transfer the data across. So the actual transfer rates we got were more like 10 megabytes a second, or roughly 80 megabits. And on top of that, our transfer, we were using sync to begin with, that just died regularly. Like, we'd transfer for a couple of hours, it would just stop, crash out, and then we'd have to start again. So we used a few tricks to try to speed things up. We tried parallel sync. There's some of these fancy tools you can get that claim to transfer your data t across the country 10 times faster than all things capable of to deal with the latency issue. Um, but all of these things, um, it still took us about a week with those tricks to transfer everything. And by that time, Postgres has these things called wall files, which store the replication data while you're taking the base backup. But it only stores so much. In the time it took us to transfer everything, the wall files had rotated, and we couldn't start replication. So spent a week transferring everything, realized we can't start replication, repeat the process all over again. So about two weeks later, we finally get reporting transferred and replication started. Reporting done. Next service, Solar. So as I mentioned before, Solar holds all the search data. Um, this is what gets queried when you run knife search or in your recipes if you run the search function against nodes or against data bags, things like that. This, the actual data stored was much, much smaller than either reporting or the chef database. And on top of that, Solar has this built-in replication. Um, it's not, it's not great replication, it's not streaming replication, it basically transfers the entire data set once every hour, but it does a fair job, and the data set we had for this was probably on the order of about, say, 10 gigabytes, rather than 100. So that meant we could just use the solar replication and things would just go across. And in case anyone's wondering, so Chef Service CTL, has, or Chef, Chef, Chef Server, rather, it has a command called reindex, where it will take all the data that you have in the Chef database, and it will populate Solar from the data in the Chef server database. The reason we didn't use that is it just takes too long to do. For this data set the size of hosted, we're probably talking at least a day to reindex everything from scratch. So it's much easier to just transfer all the data as is across from one to the other. Next backend component is Redis, or Elastic Cache. That was even simpler. So if you recall from earlier, Redis basically stored feature flags, web sessions, whether we were in maintenance mode. And all of those things, the data is pretty static. And the data we had in old hosted, that was feature flag um, settings for some ancient feature we added years ago. So what we were able to do was just start, um, the, start the new Elastic Cache or the new Redis database with a completely fresh um, blank database with just the settings that we needed um, that we could manually put. And we could manually put all the settings in for new hosted. That brings us to migration day itself. And we decided to migrate at night time. There isn't really a good downtime for Hosted Chef. Uh, you might notice before, the, over that 12 hour period, um, the load was fairly flat with the spikes. But we decided to do it when at least most customers would not be looking at Hosted Chef. But we start early in the day. First task, before anything else, lower your DNS TTLs. So if anyone doesn't know, um, TTL in DNS is basically how long after you do DNS lookup, your laptop or your server, whoever's doing the lookup, will keep the D uh, name information without looking up again. Which means if the person goes and changes it, such as during a migration, you'll still have all the old information. So we loaded it to 60 seconds, which meant that when we flipped the switch, 
most, if not all of our customers, um, would change over within the 60 seconds. Next, we do test run. Um, that's just test migration, and then we make a few final config changes. And then nighttime came, and we do our actual migration process. First thing, update status site. Let all of you know we're going to migrate. Then we enable maintenance mode, and then we do we actually migrate the databases. This is just the procedure that we mentioned before: flipping switches where we've got replication on, um, initiating data transfers where we don't have replication, and. Um, <clears throat> and then using like the solar application. Then we test. We do a quick test with an organization. We've took out maintenance mode, make sure everything worked. Then we do a quick load test, which we've tested earlier. We just want to do a final load test, make sure everything didn't fall over. Then we flip DNS, un maintenance mode hosted, and then we update the status site, and we migrated. So I mentioned load testing there. We did a homegrown tool called Chef Swarm that just simulates lots and lots of chef runs at once. And we used it to simulate peak load, like top of the hour load, um, and you hosted. And we tested against a single organization, like just test org that we had, uh, that was out of maintenance mode, so we could still do it while everyone else was still in the maintenance mode. There's a few problems with that. First, be very, very careful about running your load test against active prod. I also mentioned that we have tested against a single org. So we were like, we know this load test is not completely representative of a, um, an actual genuine load. So we expected that our load test would tell us everything's fine. And then we flip the switch, and like the fear that I had was we flip the switch, real traffic would come along, and the whole thing would fall over. Turns out the opposite happened. <clears throat> During the migration, now we did the load test earlier in the day. We knew, according to the load test, we were good. We do our final load test during the migration just to make sure everything's okay, and everything falls over. Hosted just crashes and burns, and we're like, what the heck is going on? So we double check all of our procedures, like everything's okay. We're not sure what the heck's going on, but we're thinking there's something wrong with the load test. So we knew we were good to go, flip the switch, and once we flipped the switch, live traffic came along, and Hosted took the live traffic without any problem at all. Turns out, that when we did that load test during the actual maintenance, we still had live traffic hitting the front ends and then getting a maintenance mode response back at the same time we were doing the load test. And what that meant was that the Nginx part on the front ends, they were basically taking all of the current production traffic plus retries and the load test at once, and that was why it fell over. So lesson learned there is be very, very careful with your load testing. It doesn't always tell you the truth. So we migrated. Load testing is complete. We flip DNS, and everything's great. And these are the results. It's kind of hard to see there, but the top graph is right before the migration. And that is the top of the owl peak, which at 90th percentile is roughly 500 milliseconds for an average request, or for 90th percentile request, rather. Right after the migration, that went down to 50 milliseconds for the 90th percentile. So that is a factor of 10. And just to remind you, that's old hosted. Big mess, lots of services, hard to understand. I'm not convinced I fully understood this architecture before the migration probably understood most of it, but not convinced myself. And that's the architecture afterwards. Much cleaner architecture, much better, much easier to understand architecture. Um, we've got much improved deployment method. We've got better ability to scale. We can just add new instances as we need them. 
and we're running the same Chef Server packages as everyone here who is running Chef Server. Any questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. So the question was, are we exposing Hosted Chef to hosts outside of AWS? And the answer is yes. We do have a lot of customers who are located in AWS, US East 1, and some, sometime before the migration, we kind of checked where most of our customers were coming from. But yes, Hosted Chef is available for anyone who wants to use Chef. And chances are, if you, um, <clears throat> if you are using Chef to begin with, something like Learn Chef or um, a Chef tutorial, you may have touched Hosted Chef just to get up and running really quickly. Um, someone else has a question? Mm -hmm. How do you manage the configuration of the machines? Do you use Chef Zero, or do you point to like the front end at your Chef server? To manage we point front ends at a separate Chef server. Okay. Um, so originally, we had um, we just had a separate Chef server. Now, um, as of about March this year, we're using Chef Delivery. Okay. So that's a whole other talk. Yeah. Okay. So the other question is: Are you guys going to move to the Chef AJ? Um, quite possibly, yes. However, when we do that, I don't know. Um, uh, just, just curious how long your maintenance for? So we, we actually scheduled a maintenance window of about four hours. Um, that was just to allow time to transfer everything over, because um, we need to transfer that over the whole Chef database. And um, also to allow time to troubleshoot any issues that came up. We probably got through the migration in about probably a little under half of that time. So let's say one and a half hours. Um, any more questions? Yes? What's the total node count? The total node count is about 400,000 managed nodes. And about how many organizations? Um, about 100,000. House staffed. We have a team of it's about four or five people right now. Are they 100% host chef? They. So we used to be 100% host chef. This is actually this is another big reason for the migration. In addition to the devs uh, working on hosted chef, we were spending all of our time dealing with issues with host chef. We had like these micro outages constantly, and just dealing with these issues. Um, since we migrated. We've actually been able to be not 100% focused on hosted chef anymore. So we've moved on to other services. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone.